Good morning. Nice to see you today. We march on through the season of Lent. It's hard to believe we're almost all the way through. We have our final Lenten midweek service coming up this Wednesday, 4.30 and 7.15. We'll conclude our ministry series looking at Jesus as servant. So looking forward to seeing what Vicar John does with that. And then next Sunday will be Palm Sunday. Uh, Maundy Thursday service at 6.30, Good Friday service at 6.30, and then something a little bit different for Easter here in a couple weeks. A, uh, in the past, we've done an 8 o'clock service, a 10.30 service, and then a, a sunrise service at 6.30. This year, we're just going to have two services, the early one at 7 a.m., not 8, but 7, and then the late service at, at 10.30, uh, with, with a good chunk of time in the middle for our for our Easter breakfast. So we hope, hopefully you can join us for that, bring friends, bring family. Promises to be a good time, but it's right around the corner. Looking forward to that. And on the topic of Lent, a uh, women's event on Tuesday, Lent by Candlelight, here at 6.30, a meditation on, on Christ's last words on the cross, and uh, we'd love to see you attend that. Um, a few other announcements here. Um, Youth Nerf Night, that's coming up on March 22nd, 6th uh, through 12th graders. It's going to be hosted at St. Andrew in West Fargo. You can sign up on the Ministry Action Board or you can talk to, talk to Emily. She has some more details about that. March 24th, uh, that's next Sunday, we'll have our sort of regularly scheduled spring uh, <clears throat> potluck and voters meeting after the late service, so hopefully you can join us. I don't think it'll be a terribly long meeting. We don't have huge things to, to vote on and discuss, but it's good for everyone to stay in the loop about the mission and ministry here at Our Redeemer. Um, one thing that's not in the bulletin, but maybe kind of stow it away in your head, um, <clears throat> on Wednesday evenings, you know, after Easter, we'll continue with confirmation and cross-training. Um, we, we've done a, a parenting class earlier in the year. Uh, the, the mayors did their worldview class in April, I'm going to kind of set out to lead a marriage class. Um, so if, if you'd be interested, you and your spouse, um, on attending that, kind of look what the Bible says about marriage, to kind of think about marriage as Christians. Um, we'll, we'll have more announcements about that in the next couple of weeks, but, but maybe consider that. Uh, marriage is a beautiful institution ordained by God, but we all know it's not easy. It's challenging, and we need to be bolstered by God's Word and our Christian community. All right, I think that's all I have for announcements. Uh, glad that you're all here today. Let's go ahead and stand, share a Christian greeting, and then we will sing our opening hymn. You may be seated.
Please stand as we begin our worship. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Our help is in the name of the Lord, who made heaven and earth. If you, O Lord, kept a record of sins, O Lord, who could stand? But with you there is forgiveness, therefore you are feared. Since we are gathered to hear God's word, call upon him in prayer and praise, and receive the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ in the fellowship of this altar. Let us first consider our unworthiness, and confess before God and one another that we have sinned in thought, word, and deed, and that we cannot free ourselves from our sinful condition. Together as his people, let us take refuge in the infinite mercy of God, our Heavenly Father, seeking his grace for the sake of Christ and saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Almighty God, have mercy upon us, forgive us our sins, and lead us to everlasting life. Amen. Almighty God, in his mercy, has given his Son to die for you, and for his sake forgives you all your sins. As a called and ordained servant of Christ and by his authority, I therefore forgive you all your sins. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Lord, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Almighty God, you made a way for us to be your people by appointing your Son, Jesus Christ, to be our mediator. By your great goodness, mercifully look upon your people that we may be governed and preserved evermore in body and soul. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. You may be seated for our readings from the Bible. The first reading is from Jeremiah chapter 31. Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. Not like the covenant that I made with their fathers on the day when I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt. My covenant that, I bro that they broke, though I was their husband, declares the Lord. But this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, declares the Lord. I will put my law within them, and I will write it on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. And no longer shall each one teach his neighbor and each his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me, from the least of them to the greatest, declares the Lord. For I will forgive their iniquity, and I will remember their sin no more. This is the word of the Lord. The epistle reading is from Hebrews chapter 5. For every high priest chosen from among men is appointed to act on behalf of men in relation to God, to offer gifts and sacrifices for sins. He can deal gently with the ignorant and wayward, since he himself is beset with weakness. Because of this, he is obligated to offer sacrifice for his own sins, just as he does for those of the people. And no one takes this honor for himself, but only when called by God, just as Aaron was. So also Christ did not exalt himself to be made a high priest, but was appointed by him who said to him, You are my son, today I have begotten you. As he says also in another place, You are a priest forever, after the order of Melchizedek. In the days of his flesh, Jesus offered up prayers and supplications with loud cries and tears to him who was able to save him from death, and he was heard because of his reverence. Although he was a son, he learned obedience through what he suffered. And being made perfect, he became the source of eternal salvation to all who obey him, being designated by God a high priest after the order of Melchizedek. This is the word of the Lord. We stand and sing the Lenten verse. I think we're going to skip that. Is that all right, Sue? Okay. Let's move on to the Gospel reading. The Holy Gospel according to St. Mark, the 10th chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. And they were on the road going up to Jerusalem, and Jesus was walking ahead of them. 
and they were amazed, and those who followed were afraid. And taking the twelve again, he began to tell them what was going to happen to him, saying, See, we are going up to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man will be delivered over to the chief priests and the scribes, and they will condemn him to death and deliver him over to the Gentiles. And they will mock him and spit on him and flog him and kill him. And after three days he will rise. And James and John, sons of Zebedee, came up to him and said to him, Teacher, we want you to do for us whatever we ask of you. And he said to them, What do you want me to do for you? And they said to him, Grant us to sit, one at your right hand and one at your left, in your glory. Jesus said to them, You do not know what you are asking. Are you able to drink the cup that I drink, or to be baptized with the baptism with which I am baptized? And they said to him, We are able. And Jesus said to them, The cup that I drink you will drink, and with the baptism with which I am baptized you will be baptized. But to sit at my right hand or at my left is not mine to grant, but it is for those for whom it has been prepared. And when the ten heard it, they began to be indignant at James and John. And Jesus called them to him and said to them, You know that those who are considered rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their great ones exercise authority over them. But it shall not be so among you. But whoever would be great among you must be your servant, and whoever would be first among you must be slave of all. For even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. We continue by confessing our Christian faith in the words of the Nicene Creed. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of his Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten, not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary and was made man, who was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried, and the third day he rose again according to the scriptures and ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of the Father. And he will come again with glory to judge both the living and the dead, whose kingdom will have no end. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshipped and glorified, who spoke by the prophets. And I believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins. And I look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. You may be seated. We invite the kids to come forward for the children's message. Good morning, everyone. How are you guys doing this morning? Good, good. I was a little quiet, still waking up a little bit? Yeah. Well, today, I want to ask you guys a question. Who are your favorite people to talk to? Who are your favorite people that you get to see? Can someone raise their hand and tell me? Oh, your mom and dad? Yeah, yeah, we love getting to see our parents. Yeah. Yeah, your friends, good. Yeah. Oh, your grandpa? We love to go see our grandparents, right? And talk to them. One more. Your dog? <laughs> That's good, good. Well, there are a lot of people that we like to talk to and we like to get to see. And when you want to talk to your grandparents, do you, do you always get to talk to them right away? 
No, right? Sometimes our grandparents live far away and we don't get to see them in person all the time. Uh, but, but how do you talk to them if you don't get to see them right in front of you? Yeah. Yeah, you can call them. You can call them on a phone, right? Yeah. Yeah, you can go to their house. And sometimes, when we can't always go to their house, we, we call people on our phones, right? We get to talk to them, and we can go, and there are a number of apps you can go to to call people on your phone. Um, in fact, I think I'm getting a call right now. Uh oh. Yeah, there we go. Who's that? It's Pastor Sam. Hey, Pastor Sam, how's it going? Okay, I have to go get a cookie. I got hungry this morning. Oh, okay, good. You had to go get a cookie. He's getting a cookie because he got a little hungry. He'll be back in a minute. Cool. Well, I hope you, I hope you enjoy your cookie. Huh? What are you doing? Oh, just uh, leading the children's message up here. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, probably should. All right. You enjoy your cookie. See you later. See ya. Bye. <laughs> that was silly of Pastor Sam to call, wasn't it? <laughs> well, we can use our phones to talk to people, even when they're not right in front of us. So this maybe gets to where this children's message is going. How do we talk to God? He isn't always right in front of us, right? We don't always get to see him standing right in front of us and talk to him. Yeah, yeah, we pray to him, right? And we can pray to him and we can know that he hears us. Just like a phone that lets us talk to other people, and even when they're far away, because Jesus died on the cross, he gives us the ability to talk to God and know that we can hear him even though he isn't right in front of us. When we fold our hands and close our eyes, we know that he hears us even when we talk to him, even when it feels like we're alone maybe. God is there, and because of Christ's death on the cross, we can speak to him in prayer. Let's go ahead and pray to him now and thank God for that. Dear God, thank you so much for letting us talk to you through Jesus. We love you, Jesus. Amen. All right, you can go ahead and head back to your seats. Grace, mercy, and peace be yours this day from God our Father, through our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. 
Well, our text for this morning is based off of the epistle reading, as you maybe were able to tell from the title. We're talking about the book of Hebrews, and the book of Hebrews has a lot to say about Jesus as our, as our high priest. And it's maybe something that we don't always think about. I mean, that's not something that's very important and immediate in our lives today. I mean, we think about priests and maybe apart from the Catholic Church, you don't really think anything about priests uh, being involved in your daily life. But when we talk about the book of Hebrews, it's, it's good to understand some background there because the writer of Hebrews was writing to a Jewish audience. Maybe some of you might be familiar with this. I mean, when I showed up here, I remember we were just finishing up a Bible study, uh, an adult Bible class on the book of Hebrews. And as we get into this sermon, if you weren't there for that or you don't remember it because it's been a while, that's okay. We're going to get to really just the big theme, one of the big themes of Hebrews, which is Jesus as our high priest. And it's important to know who the author of Hebrews was talking to because as a Jewish community, the high priest or the priesthood would have been very, very familiar to them. That would have been very important to them because that was kind of the the central part, you could say, of of their spiritual life. The priest was a very important figure there. And there are a few things that the priest did, and it's worth keeping those in mind because we see how those are really what Jesus does for us. What do we know about high priests? Well, in the Old Testament, uh, maybe you think of the high priest as someone who wore kind of nice robes. They had a plate with uh, stones on them, one for each tribe of Israel. And maybe we think about what they look like, but our reading actually says a lot more about what they did. If you look at the very first verse of the reading, it says, every high priest is selected from among the men and is appointed as a representative before them, before God in matters related to God. The high priest was chosen from among all the other priests and he was chosen to be the people's representative. He would go before God and he would be the one who would stand there on behalf of the people. And as the high priest, you had special access. When you think about the temple in Jesus' time, you can, it, there were kind of like certain areas you could go into. You had different clearance levels. Maybe if you were to think about that as the church, if you were out in the hallway, that was kind of about where the, the normal people could go, where they bring their sacrifices and drop them off with the priest. The priest would then take them and they could go into the next part inside the temple. Maybe you could think of that as where you're all sitting right now. The priest could go into that area, and then there was one more area, kind of a third level of clearance. You could imagine if you were in the temple, there would be a huge curtain, maybe like right where the railing is. If you imagined a curtain, floor to ceiling, from wall to wall, completely covering this area right up at the front. That was the most holy place, the holy of holies. That was where the Ark of the Covenant was, the mercy seat of God, where his presence was among his people. And not everybody could go in there. Most of the priests couldn't go in there. The people who were out, outside the temple definitely couldn't go in there. Only one. Only one person could go inside that holy place, and it was the high priest. They had special access to go before God, to go into his presence and represent the people. There's a second thing that the high priest was to do. A second part of the high priestly job description Verse 1 continues, every high priest is selected to offer gifts and sacrifices for sins. That was the priest's job. Other priests did that as well. They made sacrifices for others. They took the goats or the bulls or whatever it was that they offered up as a thanks offering or an offering for sin, and they took care of those. But the high priest had a special job, a special sacrifice to make. On one day out of the whole year was the Day of Atonement where the high priest would make a sacrifice and he would go into that holy place and atone and pardon the sins of the people because of that sacrifice. That was the high priest's job. He would make a sacrifice and no matter if you missed a sacrifice or offering during your your year, if you forgot to do something or there was a sin that you forgot to make up for, to atone for by bringing an animal to the temple, it would wipe out the sins of all the people. All the counters were set back to zero. It was a reset. Any sins of the people were forgiven. And only the high priest once a year could do that. That was what the high priest did. Two responsibilities that we talk about in the reading today. 
He would represent the people before God, and he would offer gifts and sacrifices for sins. It's clear to see how the high priest was important for them. It was their way of receiving forgiveness, of being before God and accessing him. And maybe it's even more important than to see how Jesus does that for us. The big theme of Hebrews is that Jesus is our high priest. Jesus offered sacrifices, a sacrifice, I should say, for us. Though he didn't offer an animal, he offered himself. As our high priest, he offered his own self as the sacrifice for our sin. And that sacrifice doesn't need to be repeated again and again and again like it always happened in the Old Testament. That sacrifice is a once-for-all sacrifice. One sacrifice that he made for the sins of the whole world, for all time, for all people, for all who believe in him. And because of that, we have been given the free gift of forgiveness. All who believe have been given free pardon for all of their sins. And not only that, Christ intercedes for us. We get a whole bunch of different words that kind of talk about what that means. Uh, In Timothy, Paul says that we have one mediator between God and man, Jesus Christ. We have one person who, who speaks for us. And that's what it means to intercede, to mediate. Jesus goes before the Father with the special access that he has and he speaks before him on our behalf. You can think about what that means and we've all experienced that. Maybe you've all thought about the first day of school. Do any of you remember what it was like the first day of school, the time you went? Maybe you didn't know anybody, but you had one friend who went to the same school that you did and you were trying to figure out who to talk to, how to get to know people. And Well, I was thinking about that a little bit. Back my, uh, the first time I went to high school, they had an orientation day where you could go in and kind of get used to the school, find your locker and get everything set up the way you wanted to, put the shelf lockers in and have all your books sitting there. And they had a little lunch in the afternoon where you could kind of sit down and the intent, I think, was to kind of get to know people. But when I kind of looked around, I was kind of scared to talk to anybody because I had no idea who anyone was. I went to school a half hour away from my hometown and I didn't really know too many people there. But my parents were with and they struck up a conversation with someone else's parents and they got talking and they looked over and said, oh, John, look, have you met this person? This this is Dan and Sarah and this is their son, Joel. And so we got to talking, we said hi and we talked a little bit more and we didn't really see each other until school started and because of that, I, I got to know him. I developed a relationship with him and actually because of him, I got to know several other people in a part of our robotics club that I might not have gotten to meet otherwise. When Jesus intercedes for us, it's more than just him speaking on our behalf. It's him giving us access to God. We don't have to think that we can't talk to God. Because of Jesus, when we pray, we know that we are heard by him. We have access and can speak to him. I mean, we do that all the time. We pray to him because Christ has given us that access as our high priest. He has gone before the Father and he has brought us into his presence that we can get to know him and who he is. That's how Jesus fulfills the roles of the high priest, fulfills that job description in verse 1. And there's one more thing I want to get to in verse 2. If that's what Jesus does as our high priest, what kind of high priest is he? It talks about this in Hebrews. Hebrews says that high priests were able to deal gently with those who were ignorant and going astray since the high priest himself was subject to weakness. Every high priest of Israel's history was still a sinful human being. They still fell short. They were still ignorant at times and they were wayward. They went astray just like the people and they could understand what the people had done. They could understand that because they were human too. And if we're honest, we fall into that category as well. And I'll, I'll be fair, it's, it sounds kind of strong to say that we are ignorant Christians. And especially since many of us have lived in the faith. We've grown up from a very young age knowing the promises of God and being familiar with them. So I want to clarify a little bit kind of what he's talking about there. He understands those who sin unintentionally, who sin without knowing and those who sin even in what they know they're doing. Those who know of their sin and those who sin without knowing what they do. 
And I think that's something we can really relate to. Ignorance is not, is not knowing something. And how many times, even though we've known the promises of God, even though we know who he is and who he is for us, how many times as Christians do we not know what to do in a situation? We're faced with difficult decisions. And maybe we're faced with <laughs> decisions and we sin and we don't even know it. How many times have we gotten angry at someone and not known all the details, which would have made everything made a lot more sense if we would have known? How many times have we gotten angry and not had really any reason to? How many times have we not known how best to explain something to a child? How best to teach them? How often have we had tried to hold so many things together in our life and we don't know which things to hang on to, which thing to give a little more time to now, which thing to tend to later? We don't know the best ways to do things all the time. We're faced with difficult decisions and we don't always know how to respond. We can sin intentionally when we do that. It may be even worse, sometimes we know what's wrong and we still do it anyway. Who then is our high priest? What is our high priest like? Hebrews gives an answer. We do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weakness, but we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet was without sin. Jesus understands and he sympathizes with our weaknesses. He faced every temptation that we face. And how does he respond when we fall into that? When we sin, knowingly or unknowingly? When we come before him again, week in and week out, asking for forgiveness, does he look with a cruel and contemptful look at us? Does he look at us with a deep sigh and turn to the Father and say, well, here's so and so again. They've sinned again. Does Jesus look at us in that way as our high priest? No. No, he does not. He looks at us with eyes of mercy and forgiveness. No matter how, times we come bef- how many times we come before him for repentance and forgiveness, every time Jesus forgives. He understands what we go through and he still forgives us. What does it mean then that Jesus is our high priest? There are those three things. It means that he is for us in every sense. He offered himself as a sacrifice to pardon our sin. He speaks before God the Father on our behalf and gives us access to him. And he sympathizes with us repeatedly when we sin and forgives us. He understands our weaknesses and offers forgiveness to us each and every day when we call upon him and we trust his promises. What is our response to that? It's one of confidence, isn't it? We aren't scared to come before him, but we are confident that he hears us and that he is for us. We are confident to trust him and to serve him alone. Christ was the only one who could do these things. He was the only one who could be our high priest, to be tempted as we were without sin, to be offer himself as a sacrifice and to go before God's presence. He was the only one who could be our high priest, and he did so for you and I. Thanks be to God that Christ has done that for us. Amen. We continue with the prayers of the church. Please stand. In our prayers for this morning, we especially remember Matt and Bobby Nicholas, Sue Helms, Joanne Fickner, and Gary Ureen. Let us pray for the church of God and for all people according to their needs. We pray for the church, both in our own communities as well as in distant places, that all might come to saving faith in Christ. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for all those who feel burdened, exhausted, burnt out or weary. Grant that they would find times of physical rest as well as spiritual rest and peace through your word and in your promises. Refresh them and lift, fill them up to continue in service and love for God and for one another. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for all those in need, that the Lord would provide shelter for the homeless, food for the hungry, 
peace for the troubled, stability to those who face uncertainty, and hope for all those who grieve. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for all families that parents would continually and faithfully train up their children in the ways that they should go, and that their children would grow in their faith. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for all those who are sick, for those in recovery, and for all who are in need of healing, especially Matt and Bobby, Sue, Joanne, and Gary, that the Lord would grant them healing for their illnesses as well as peace and strength to endure their trials. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Into your hands we commend all for whom we pray, trusting in your mercy through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. You may be seated for the offering. We continue with the service of the sacrament. The Lord be with you. <clears throat> Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is truly good, right, and salutary that we should at all times and in all places give thanks to you, O Lord, Holy Father, Almighty and everlasting God for the countless blessings you so freely bestow on us in all creation. Above all, we give thanks for your boundless love shown to us when you sent your only begotten Son, Jesus Christ, into our flesh and laid on him our sin, giving him into death that we might not die eternally. Because he is now risen from the dead and lives and reigns to all eternity, all who believe in him will overcome sin and death and will rise again to new life. Therefore, with angels and archangels, and with all the company of heaven, we laud and magnify your glorious name, evermore praising you and saying, Blessed are you, O Lord, our God, King of all creation, for you've had mercy on us and given your only begotten Son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. In your righteous judgment, you condemn the sin of Adam and Eve who ate the forbidden fruit, and you justly barred them and all their children from the tree of life. Yet in your great mercy, you promise salvation by a second Adam, your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, and made his cross a life-giving tree for all who trust in him. We give you thanks for the redemption you have prepared for us through Jesus Christ. Grant us your Holy Spirit that we may faithfully eat and drink of the fruits of his cross and receive the blessings of forgiveness, life, and salvation that come to us in his body and blood. At this time we stand for our Lord's Prayer. Hear us as we pray in his name and as he has taught us. 
Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to the disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body which is given for you. This do in remembrance of me. In the same way also he took the cup after supper, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you. This cup is the New Testament in my blood, which is shed for you for the forgiveness of all your sins. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord be with you always. Amen. Please be seated.
Now may the body and blood of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, strengthen and preserve you in body and soul to life everlasting. Depart in peace and joy. Amen. We sing the Nook Dimittis. Let us pray. We give thanks to you, Almighty God, that you have refreshed us through this salutary gift, and we implore you that of your mercy you would strengthen us through the same in faith toward you and in fervent love toward one another. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Amen. We sing our closing hymn, Almighty Father, bless the word. It's great to worship with you all today. Uh, just a few reminders. Lent by candlelight, that's on Tuesday evening. Uh, could potentially be a very enriching activity. Um, also, we'll conclude our Wednesday Lenten services this week, 4.30 and 7.15. Um, parenting class coming up in April. More uh, news to follow there. Uh, kids, love to see them in Sunday school today. Um, Emily is here, um, so that's good. Adults, we are just getting into the Gospel of Luke. So come join us downstairs for some coffee and donuts and, uh, and a good uh, journey through the Gospel of Luke. I want to thank Vicar John for his sermon today. Uh, uh, a good teaching on what it means that Jesus is our high priest. It's important to have that context, that Old Testament context, and to see how Jesus is that ultimate high priest, how he does make atonement for our sins once and for all. But he also gives us this access to the Father. He reconciles us to the Father and 
and acts as an, as a, as an intercessor, a mediator, now and forever. So thank you for that good reminder today. God bless you all. We'll greet you in the hallway.